my childhood was spent in the Methodist Church, my early childhood. Uh, Fairview Methodist Church, to be exact, in Birmingham, Alabama. Um, Fairview was an old church. It, um, it was a brick church. It had a big sanctuary with stone steps coming up from either side and then a brick facade in the front. So it was this very imposing building, especially as I remember it from my early childhood. And my parents and grandparents and great-grandparents had very deep ties in this church. My grandparents had met in the church and married and they had raised three sons, the youngest of which was my father. When he was 14 and got polio, the church totally came around our family and supported them through his seven months that he spent in the crippled children's clinic, learning how to walk on crutches, which he used for the rest of his life. He joined the church when he was 13 with his 70-year-old grandfather, uh, and when he later married my mother, he brought her, she was a Baptist, back to Methodist Church, back to Fairview Methodist. I was born and christened there, and by the time I was nine years old, I was fully ensconced in the church. It was like home. Um, our family even had, or our family, first of all, had been named Family of the Month twice. My mother taught Sunday school at the church. My father was um, the Bible study on Wednesday night. He led a Bible study group, and he had even been named deacon of the church, which meant he kind of got to help make decisions about the church. We even had our own family pew, the Hancock pew. It was the second pew from the front on the right side of the church. And I loved our pew because you could see everything. You could see the organist's hands as she played the organ each morning. And when the choir stood up, you could see everything that was going on as they sang together. And we were always the first row to be called down for communion on the Sundays that we had it with the little shot glasses full of grape juice and the stale pieces of bread. So everything about, everything about the church, it just wrapped itself around me. Um, Birmingham at that time was an interesting place. It was actually called Bombingham. That was its nickname because there had been so many bombings during that time in, in the city, bombings of black churches and businesses and even people's houses. The 16th Baptist Church was probably the most famous. It was the one where four little black girls were killed when a bomb went off. And there had been race riots in Birmingham. The, the police chief there was this man named Bull O'Connors and he had um, very famously set German police and German shepherd dogs and fire hoses on kids when they did a kids protest. So it was a really nasty place. But as a child, I didn't really know anything about that. As a child, I was just kind of in my own little world. Um, when I was five years old, because my dad was a deacon, the church sent our family to Atlanta to work for a summer in an inner city school. My dad was an artist. He taught art at a local high school. And so we went and he called all the kids in the neighborhood to come in and paint all of the windows in this kind of shabby church to paint them so they would look like stained glass. So we did that for about six or eight weeks and it was a really cool time for me because I was an only child and all of a sudden I just had all these kids to play with. You know, there were white kids, there were black kids, I think there were probably some brown kids. I don't really remember because I wasn't too cognizant of that. The one thing that I noticed about the kids is that they were a lot poorer than, than we were. Um, they didn't have shoes. Most of them came to church without any shoes and their clothes were missing buttons. There was a little girl whose name was Lee. She was, she was black and she, we had the same name, although she spelled hers differently. And we became instant friends. And I noticed that like the hems in her skirt were kind of falling out and some buttons were missing. And I just kept thinking, oh, if only my grandmother could come over because she was a seamstress. And I thought, wow, she could, she could fix everything, my grandma. But it was a great summer for me just to be able to hang out with these, these kids. Um, for my parents, it was a little bit different. It was actually a little deeper, I think. They had both been raised in Birmingham. And while my family were not overtly racist, we would never use the N-word, we tried to treat all people kindly, they were definitely a product of their, of their culture. Up until that point, they had really never associated with any 
black people beyond maybe an occasional maid who came in to help my grandmother. And they probably subscribed without knowing it to the sort of maybe equal but separate idea that was really prevalent in the South then, and maybe now. Um, so it was really interesting to them to suddenly spend time with all of these different kids and to look and to see that these kids were creative and funny and mischievous and needy and in other words they were just kids they were just kids like everyone else and the parents that came with them on occasion were also just parents like everyone else and it it really shook my parents worldview and we came back from we came back from Atlanta changed as a family um, Around that time, we this was probably around 1967 or 68, the Civil Rights Act had passed in 1965. Um, schools had been desegregated even before that, but my elementary school was still segregated until 1968 when I was going into second grade. And at that time, all of my friends at the school, who were the same friends that went to my church, all of their parents pulled them out of the school and sent them to a private school. And I begged my parents, to do that for me. Not because of the race thing, but just because I wanted to go where my friends went. But my parents were adamant. They were like, that's not that's not what we're about. And so I remained at, at Woodrow Wilson and, and it actually turned out to be fine. Um, about a year later, right before, right around 1970, the minister of our church, he was an old, white, somewhat feeble man, came to my dad and asked him if he would go with him to the state Methodist convention in Alabama. And this was a big deal. This was a weekend long convention where there would be, there would be study and there would also be, um, there would be business to attend to and any big business that had to be attended to would be voted on by all the delegates to this convention. My dad had done this before as a deacon. He really liked it. He really enjoyed this kind of stuff. And so he agreed. And it was only after he agreed that he learned that the big issue on the table was whether or not to integrate the Methodist Church in Alabama. Because even though this was five years after the Civil Rights Act, churches, Methodist churches in Alabama were still segregated. Black people could still not come to our church. Um, when the minister asked my dad how he would vote, my dad was honest and said, I'm, I'm going to vote for integration. And the minister became furious and said, um, you know, you can't, you have to vote the views of the church. And my dad didn't agree and kind of all hell broke loose at that point. The minister called all of these people, um, all of his church members, many of whom had been my dad's friends since he was born. He had gone to school with these boys, he'd gone to church with them, he had played baseball with them. You know, I still know all their names, Elsie Turman, Bo Sanderford, Gary Gilbert. I mean, it was a whole crowd of people. The minister called all these people and all of a sudden our house, which had been up to that point a pretty lively social place, became this place of late night phone calls and worried conversations. My mom quit going out with her friends. It seemed like almost overnight things began to change. and. I wasn't really sure what was going on until one day my dad told me that if my friend Lee from Atlanta was to come visit us, she wouldn't be able to go to church with us on Sunday. And my dad said, that's what we're trying to change. So I kind of got that a little bit. Anyway, things got more and more heated until finally one night my dad decided that he would call the bishop in, in Alabama, the Methodist bishop, who was sort of like a mini pope for, for Methodist in Alabama. And he was amazed that he was able to get through and, and without telling the bishop too many of the details, my dad said, you know, should I, should I vote my, the views of the church or should I vote my conscience? And the bishop said, really without pause, you should vote your conscience. So my dad knew what he needed to do. Um, things continued to sort of foment and right before my dad went to the convention he had to teach one of his Wednesday night Bible study classes and he went to this class and when he went in there were the eight to ten boys that he had grown up with they were men now and no one would speak to him no one would even look at him when he tried to say something they would talk over him if he wasn't there 
Um, if he asked a question, they would ignore him. It was a very long, painful evening. At the end of it, all the other men got up to leave and they left before my dad. And they, as they left, they very deliberately took their chairs and put a barricade across the door. Um, so that my dad, who was still on crutches from the polio, had to basically take a step, move a chair, take another step, move a chair, and in this very slow way, eventually made his way out the door. I didn't know any about this until years later, at this part of the story. Anyway, the, the, the weekend finally came. My dad and Brother Rains left for the convention on Friday, and when Sunday morning came, my mom got me up and we got dressed to go to church. Even though no one was speaking to her anymore, we still went. We walked in, we were heading toward our pew when a friend of mine, Lori Turman, one of my best friends, little friends, ran over and asked if I could sit with her and her family. And I didn't get to see Lori very much anymore because we didn't go to school together anymore. So my mom said it was okay and I went back to the Turman's pew which was all the way on the other side of the church. It was kind of in the back. It was in this dark place in the church where there weren't any stained glass windows. It was what was called the sleeper's pew, was where people slept through church. And as a little girl sitting in Lori's pew, you couldn't see anything. The only thing you could see were the backs and the hats of the people in front of us. But I was really happy to be there just to see Lori. So we were sitting there and the choir came in and the minister came in and we all rose and he blessed us and there was a, a hymn and a prayer and then we all sat down and there were some announcements and then we stood back up for another hymn and a prayer and then we sat back down and then there was the offering and this kind of went on normally until finally it was time for the sermon, which was a really good thing. Lori and I were really excited because the sermon meant that we were over halfway through and that we only had about 20 or 30 minutes left before we could be released and go and play. So the associate minister stood up because the minister was at the convention and he kind of did something different. He said, before I begin the sermon, I want to ask everyone a question. And he said, I'd like to know who in here believes that the views of the church are sacred and that, that all individuals should follow the views of the church. And if you believe that, would you please rise? So people were kind of looking at each other. This was a little bit odd and some people couldn't hear very well because it was kind of an older congregation, but slowly everyone realized that they should rise and everyone stood up, the whole church stood up and the minister was kind of standing there with his arms out like we were his flock and he beamed at us, literally beamed at us. And then he said, okay, you can sit down. And, and so we all sat down and then, and then the minister said, and just, just out of curiosity, if there's, any, if there's anyone who thinks that the individual's views are more important and that the individual should do what he thinks is right over what the church thinks is right, would, would that person stand? And I was sitting back there with the Termins and all of a sudden I saw my mom stand up way across the church. And she was a, she was a tall woman. She had long blonde, brown hair at that time. And my grandmother made her clothes and she made them kind of in that Jackie Onassis sleek thing. So she had on this trim blue, she was very thin, she had on this trim blue skirt and she had this big blue hat. And I could totally see her standing there. And um, I remember she looked at the minister first and then she looked at the organist and she looked at the choir and then she slowly looked around the whole church. And I like to think I remember that when she got to me, she sort of gave me a little nod. I didn't really know what was going on, but I knew, I knew it was big. Um, after the service, we left the church and went home. And my dad arrived later in the afternoon and he and my mom immediately went into their room and talked for a very, very long time. And then when they came out and we went to have dinner, um, I could really feel, I could really feel something in the room between them. And I think, I think if I had to say what it was, I would say it was pride. There was sort of this solidarity and pride at, at what they had done. And my dad told me that, um, that it had been a really good convention and that most of the people, most of the delegates had voted that if someone like my friend Lee wanted 
to come to our church, she should be allowed to. And my parents were really happy about that, and I was really happy about that. Um, although it was a little bit ironic too that we had finally won this right for Lee to come to a church that we were actually no longer welcome at. Um, so we never went back. We never went back to Fairview Methodist. Um, my parents were both quite religious, and so we tried out a couple of other churches. I remember this one church that was in the basement of a bank downtown. It was kind of a hippie church. My dad sort of liked that one. And then I remember there was another church in the suburbs that had a skating rink in its basement, and that one I thought was really great. But none of them really seemed to fit us, and so we gradually just gave up. My dad got more and more interested in street work with homeless people and junkies and he got into the Vietnam War protest and my mom slowly developed a new set of friends and without the fabric of the church holding us together they began to drift apart and actually within a year um, my parents divorced <clears throat> and we sort of moved on and that's a very different story. Um, but a couple of years ago I started wondering about if any if any black person ever did go to Fairview Methodist, if, if anyone ever ever did um, go to this integrated church. And I did a, a little Google research, and I couldn't find that particular piece of information, but I did find an article on the church, and it, it had a picture, and it was more or less just as I remembered with those big stone steps going up and then that big brick facade. Maybe it was a little smaller, and it was definitely shabbier, but, but it was there, it was there. And I read the article, there was an article with it, and the article said that in the 80s and 90s, the church membership had really begun to dwindle until it got so small that when the air conditioning broke in the sanctuary, they didn't have enough funds to fix it. And so they just moved down into the basement and held services there for a few years. <clears throat> but even that wasn't manageable. And finally, in 2013, the church closed its doors. Well, my dad was no longer living, but my mom still was, and I called her because I wanted to read her the last line of the article, which was that a Hispanic congregation had moved into the church and had now was having services at Fairview. Um, both she and I really liked this. This feel, felt like a really good closure, and I like to imagine sometimes what it would be like if I were ever unlikely, but if I were ever in that neighborhood again, to go and visit that church and to find out who, who is now sitting in the Hancock pew, second from the, second from the first, second from the front on the left side of the church. Thank you. So if you want to support the arts and Columbia Center for the Arts, please consider coming in and buying work or donating online at ColumbiaArts.org. Thanks a lot.